I have a granddad that was a soldier in the Soviet Union. He was stationed at a checkpoint near an airbase somewhere near Serbia. The checkpoint was surrounded by woods, and there was only one road that went to the checkpoint and to the airbase. Sometimes when he rode down the road to the checkpoint, he would find dead animals, like at least three to four, other times maybe five or six, but one day when he was riding down the road with a car, there were four guys in one car, and one of them was my granddad, he saw a bleeding deer. When he saw it, he pressed the brake pedal so hard, one of the men in the back flew to the front. My granddad told me the deer or moose thing looked scared as it was breathing really fast, as it had been running for a long time and looking everywhere. He told me that when he and one of the guys got out of the car and tried to scare it away, when they got closer, it looked like it had what appeared to be deep claw marks to the bone. As they tried to shoot away, they heard what sounded like something running in the woods, because of the branches breaking and the ground being hit repeatedly. The woods went from making a noise to silence, as he said the only thing that my granddad could hear was the breathing of the moose and the branches that were breaking in the woods. There was a good 30 to 40 meters between the road and the woods. Now the two of them, my granddad and the other guy, were standing out there without moving, scanning the wood line. Then one of the other guys in the car came out and asked why they were both standing still, when the third guy heard something running in the woods. The third guy took out a flashlight and scanned the woods with it. My granddad was quiet for two minutes, with a blank face, eyes wide open, until he started to talk again. He said that when the third guy's flashlight went across a small opening in the woods, he saw a figure standing tall in the opening, and three or four seconds later just bolted to the left in the woods. When the tall figure bolted to the left, my granddad and the second guy ran to the car and grabbed their rifles, and ran next to the third guy who was still scanning the wood line. My grandpa told me that when they heard a screeching to the left side of the road, the fourth guy came out of the car screaming, What the hell is on the road? When the fourth guy screamed, the other two guys and my granddad turned straight to the road, and they saw this tall, greyish, black coloured creature. The car on the road was still on, so the headlights pointed to the road. The only thing they saw in colour were the feet of the figure. They couldn't see the top of it because it was too dark to see the top half. My granddad said the guy who was screaming took out a handgun and shot three to five rounds at the tall figure, which screeched and ran to the other side of the road towards the woods. My granddad said that he and the other guy with the rifles ran to the car and got in. The guy with the flashlight ran and grabbed the guy screaming, pushing him into the car as they sped away. The checkpoint was some 30 kilometers away. He said this was the only other thing that made him fear for his life. He and the other three guys agreed to never speak about it to anyone else in the army. He's still alive and kicking, but never found out what on earth that creature was. My friends and I used to hike and camp by the French River in northern Ontario. For anyone unfamiliar with this area, it's extremely remote. You have to leave your car, canoe for a few hours, then carry your canoe to your campsite. And on this occasion, we were camping for 10 days. There were four of us and we didn't see another person or any signs of anyone else near us. On day three, we decided to wake up early and hike along the river going north. One of my friends was really good with maps and planning hikes for us, so he said that this one was about a 9 hour hike, there and back to our campsite. We started our hike at 6am at around noon, stopped to swim for a bit in the river to cool off, followed by some lunch that we packed and a beer or two each. We started packing up again and noticed a small cabin off to the distance about 25 meters downstream. We knew we would come back in this same direction, and we put our garbage in a bag with our beer cans and hoisted it up over the tree. This is a common thing to do, as it keeps wildlife like bears away from getting your garbage. We knew we would be back this same way in a few hours to collect it and bring it back to the main campsite. 
For the remainder of the hike, I couldn't help but feel like someone was watching us, but there were no other signs of people around us. When we reached the end point, nearly exhausted but also satisfied with how far we had come, we debated stopping again for a rest before making the six hour walk back to our main campsite. As we discussed, I mentioned that I kind of wanted to get back to our campsite because I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Two of my three friends then also admitted they had had similar feelings, so we decided to head back. As we approached the area where we rested and swam earlier, we came across our garbage bag. It had been removed from the tree and emptied. The weird thing was that it wasn't ripped or torn as you might expect from an animal. Instead, it was untied and neatly emptied and left wide open on the ground. We remembered the old cabin downstream, but there were no signs of it this time. As we walked a little further, we saw something on top of a rock. It was our beer cans. We consumed two each, so there were eight empty beer cans, only they weren't scattered on the rocks as you might expect from an animal. They were neatly piled in a pyramid shape. As we got closer, we realized the cans and noticed a Polaroid photo tucked underneath the bottom of one. It was a photo of the four of us swimming. Completely freaked out at this point, we half ran, half walked back to our campsite. We arrived at dusk and decided that this night would be our last night of our originally planned 10 day camping trip. None of us slept a wink that night. We stayed up by the fire, terrified and hoping for morning to come. By sunrise, we packed up and hiked out with our little canoes. We were so happy to see our vehicles where we'd left them and drove home together in silence, stunned by the experience. I am from Finland, and that's also where the things that I'm about to share with you happened. This was many years ago, pre-smartphone era in the 90s, and it was the end of summer. Me and two friends were on a camping trip way up north in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food and gear for a 10-day trek. I used to be quite the avid outdoorsman in my youth. The car we arrived in had been left at the parking lot of a visitor center within the parameters of the Urho Kekonen National Park, a 985 square mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain there varies greatly from treeless and semi-mountainous. We don't have real mountains in Finland, but we have what we call Tunturi, which is close, to somewhat dense forests of spruce and birch. There are lots of swamps, seeing reindeer isn't uncommon, and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You can theoretically run into a bear in this place, but of course normally they avoid people. So, we mostly camped in a tent, but some nights we use shelters and simple huts provided for by travelers, free of charge by the forestry service, called Erankampa. The trip had lasted five days so far, and we were at the furthest point from any kind of civilization. We were going to be on that particular outing truly in the middle of nowhere. There really was nothing there at all. No villages, towns or industries. The place is a massive national park after all. Seeing other hikers happened from time to time. You'd see people in the distance maybe, very rarely would you come face to face with anyone. So in the middle of our trip we had camped in a small clearing. Woodland extended around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark, we had eaten our evening meal and all three of us were jammed in our only tent. It was a bit cramped, but we fit. It was a large tent. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humor in the dark like guys in their 20s do, about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags, when we quieted down and began to hear it, talking and the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent because there were no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us, but we couldn't quite make out what was being said. It was certainly a human voice, no doubt about it. A distant droning though, but nothing I could really explain the sound of heavy machinery by. 
It sounded like an excavator or a tank, something big and powerful, not really too far away, combined with the sound of talking. Okay, we thought, construction yard. But at that time of night, in an unpopulated protective nature reserve, we got out of our tent. It was cold and pitch black. The campfire still had some coals glowing, and we took out our flashlight. My two buddies have always been a lot braver than me. The sound was clearly coming from the direction of north, maybe half a kilometer away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away, and we could see no lights or anything. We could still not make out what was being said. The speaking-like voice was monotonous, and it was impossible to even say which language was being used. But it did sound like a person speaking, though. You may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of hearing human voice in static. Maybe you've used a blow dryer and been sure someone is talking, turn it off, and it was just your brain trying to interpret the steady hum of the machine. Maybe it was sort of like that. It's hard to explain, really. The machinery sound continued, not loudly, but you could make out the powerful engine, at times accelerating, adding power, and at times idle. My two friends resolved to go find out what was going on. We put our warm clothes back on, donned boots, and I sat next to the dying fire, adding more wood to it. I would stay at camp, while my buddies left to check out this mysterious construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So there I sat. The guys took out their maps, took out a compass, and headed left, and I could hear them make their way through the forest. I could see the light from their flashlights and then they were gone. The weird sounds continued though, unaltered. They were gone for 15 minutes, then 30, then the better part of an hour. It was odd, judging by the volume of the sound, they should have reached it, checked it out, and been back already. I added more firewood and tried to make out what the other people talking about were saying, but it was too tinny and obscure. Soon the guys had been away for over two hours. I figured they just stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. And then the sound stopped. Just like that. It all ended all at the same time. The engine sound and the voice just both quit. It was very silent. I waited another half hour, very concerned that something had happened. Maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try and find them? I shouted their names several times and built a fire pretty big. I was scared, when suddenly I saw the flashlights of my friends approaching. Apparently they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to camp and out of breath, and told me what happened. They had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance. There was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source of the sound. I had to stop every now and then, be quiet and listen to be able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, then realized they were not getting any closer. The sounds did not change in volume at all. They decided to just go a bit further several times, when suddenly the sounds stopped, like someone had pressed a button on a recording. They realized they had been going on for a while, and they were in the middle of the dark woods alone. They reversed the direction and started going back at a brisk pace and eventually saw my huge fire from atop the hill and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seem to think the sound stopped at different times. They had been gone two and a half hours in total, and they said the sound stopped at around an hour and fifteen minutes after they left. They then started heading back immediately, return trip taking a bit longer, even though they kept a good pace. They apparently wandered around semi-lost in the dark. For me, the sound stopped at the two hour mark just 30 minutes before they returned. We didn't sleep that night. Nothing more happened on the trip and we never found out what weird construction yard sound was about. But when we returned to the park visitor center some five days later, we asked around and no one knew of any construction taking place in the national park area. And it's been bugging me ever since. My two friends and I were hiking in a pretty popular spot in our area. It's an 150 foot waterfall that takes about 45 minutes of uphill hiking to get to. We decided to go bouldering around the bottom of the waterfall, 
There are various little pools and boulders where water runs off from the waterfall, and this bouldering trail is not on the main trail, and not many hikers ever veer off the main trail. That's when my friends and I found a 22-year-old girl face down in the mud, with both her legs broken and compound fractures. She had no cell phone, no water, no food and nothing to keep her warm. Next to her was her friend, who didn't make it. We found her and obviously called 911, gave her any supplies we had, and eventually a helicopter showed up and flew her to the nearest hospital. Turns out she was hiking with her friend the night before, when they both fell off the waterfall. Her friend must have gone to get help, but unfortunately passed away less than a hundred yards from where we found the girl. So no one knew she was hurt, or that she was even there. It's a miracle she was still alive and mind-blowing to think what she had gone through when we found her some 20 hours later. I went hunting two years ago with my dad and his best friend who I just call my uncle. My dad and uncle have been hunting for 35 years, mostly moose but sometimes bison or elk or caribou if moose didn't work out that year. So usually they buy a moose tag each and someone gets an elk tag or whatever just in case. And every time, even though they've never needed it, they've each brought a bear tag, one for a black and one for a grizzly. When we hunt, you are a full day's travel by boat before you see civilization, sometimes up to two. The only communication is by satellite phone. Sometimes stuff happens out there and you have to be prepared if things go south. Now, you can hopefully explain to the officials later that you had to kill that animal that you had no tag for in self-defense and hopefully they'd believe you. But if you just buy a tag, you know that legally you're safe to take whatever measures necessary for protection. But like I said, they've never needed those tags, not in three and a half decades of being out there despite all their numerous bear encounters. So anyway, my dad knows an outfitter who had a small plywood shack out down the river, and he warns us that a buddy of his recently used the shack and had bear trouble. So he decided to line the outside with corrugated tin. We know our bear safety and it's bear country all over, so we decide to stay. Night one, no problem. However, fresh bear crap is on sight. Rifles up and eyes open. Chat loud all night, smash big pieces of scrap tin together so the ear-splitting, snapping boom echoes off into the hills. The next day, we're up early and out hunting. Not much luck though, but we make some friends over the river they're camped upstream by a slough we usually frequent, and we stop the boats to drift and chat a bit. Turns out one of them knows the outfitter whose cabin we're in, and he tells us a few things. Someone recently used it and had bear trouble, then decided to illegally bait the bear with hot dogs every night for a week in order to lure it to camp so he could shoot it. Only he never committed. He just fed a bear. He made noise and stink and threatening actions, then fed the bear treats, actively teaching it that these things are safe and okay things will result in food. Well, crap. We do some more traveling upstream, see nothing and go back to camp. Trail into camp from the river marked by some spare jerry cans we have full of fuel, and one of them has been dragged into the middle of the trail and bitten in two places, punctured several times and is still leaking. So we get our rifles up, get into camp, and it turns out our grub stash was broken into. We must have not locked it upright, or the culprit knew what they were doing from experience. The camp is a mess, half the food is gone, and someone emptied and tore up a plastic bag that had been catched in a patch of moss behind the shack, and there's debris everywhere. Then we realize there's a bear in camp. I'm ahead of dad and uncle, so I call it out as soon as I see the mess. There's still ice stuck to some of the bags that had frozen food in it. This just happened. I know the bear's here, he's likely watching or listening to me right now, and I'm scanning the area unable to see a damn thing. We clean up, 
lock up tighter, store stuff in the boat, and even start pissing everywhere making more noise, shouting, hollering, smashing tin, using the foghorn to scare it away. I look around more to try and find out exactly what we're dealing with. The ground in camp is all moss and sticks, but if it had bit the gas cans at the trailhead, then it might have come down from the beach where there was sand. I found the tracks I was looking for but couldn't decide what they were from. Claws out suggested grizzly, but they were very small prints and the only clear tracks were going up a steep incline, so it could have been a black trying to grip the sand. That night it was outside the shack. We hear it walking around, we hear it sniffing the walls from the outside. There's a small porch off the front of the shack and we hear it walking there and we shout to no avail. This is where it sinks in that we're in big trouble with this bear that has absolutely no fear of us, none at all. It doesn't care about the noise. It doesn't care that there are several of us and it doesn't care that the camp smells of our piss and smoke. It has learned that these things are not a threat to it. It has learned that this place has food and these sounds and behaviors are signals that more food has been brought here and has become available. It's October in the Arctic. This boy is ready to make a few final big meals before finding a den for the winter and he isn't leaving. All night the bear circles the shack. My uncle tries to sleep, but he can hear the bear sniffing his head from two inches away through the plywood and tin. My dad sleeps. The bear action increases and becomes more daring as the night goes on. My uncle and I try to sleep a bit as well, but it's on and off and light. As the wee morning hours settle in, the bear becomes more aggressive, chuffing, clapping his teeth, pacing around the shack, pacing the porch, sniffing the door and sometimes standing and peering into the windows. It's dark, and all we can see is a shape out there in the shadows. My uncle and I agree to let my dad sleep as much as possible now. He's our best shooter, and we want him to be well rested for the inevitable showdown that's coming at dawn, like some horrible Wild West movie. Finally, it's time to begin. The bear is ready. It starts trying to open the door. The door only has a wire and two nails holding it shut. Skookum's hardware to be sure, but nonetheless wanting. It's dark inside the shack, so every time the bear finds an edge to grip onto with its teeth and tries to pull the door open, the wood flexes and lets in a flash of white morning light around the doorframe. I'll never forget that. It pulling a few times, losing its grip, getting a better grip then pulling again. Flash, 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 pause, trying to open the door to get to us or our food or whatever. My dad, of course, is up by now, miffed about missing the evening's excitement, but ready to take care of this. We have a quick exchange between the three of us in which we all quickly agree with great resignation and disappointment that we need to take this animal's life. We have never killed a bear. We've never wanted to, we love bears, they're such beautiful and powerful animals. To see a big healthy bear all fat with a shiny coat roaming in its natural habitat, it's a sign that the entire ecosystem and food chain leading up to it are healthy. They're a symbol of a healthy ecosystem and a truly incredible piece of nature. But this one has been ruined. It's been fed. There's no curing this, there's no fixing it, and there's no leaving this cabin with that thing at our door. I stand at one tiny plexiglass window and my uncle at the other, and my dad stands at the door with his rifle loaded and ready. There's no tin on the door, so he considered shooting through it. The bear hears him and has dropped back to all fours and is sniffing the base of the door now. I'm helping dad line up the shot to its head, when suddenly it swings its head up and walks the few feet over to the window. It stands and I find myself staring face to face with this big fat black bear, with small brown eyes with very small pupils staring back at me, inches away with nothing but plexi between us. I'm staring into this thing's eyes and I'm imagining this all going wrong. It hurting me, devastating my mother, it hurting my dad and devastating me. And for the first time in my life, I feel the fight, flight and freeze response. I feel rage, the audacity of this animal to not piss off when we goddamn told it to. 
I bare my teeth in a snarl, jerked towards it suddenly, screaming at it and slamming my hands against the window frame to make one big jarring motion and noise. But it didn't flinch. It didn't even blink. It just stared back, deadpan. He drops back down and sniffs the door, sniffs where he'd left the scraps the day before that we'd cleaned up, moving a foot away, a few more feet, just over by the wood pile, and now. My dad steps out onto the porch in all his glory, wearing nothing but his boxers, his boots and his glasses. He raises the rifle and shoots, hitting what must have been the lungs. The bear drops. Immediately it tries to stand again, and it manages to stand up on its back legs, but the front of its body and its face are still laying on the ground, and it's trying to drag itself upwards. The second shot saw it stay down, using a wide circle to get it close behind the head and away from the paws. The final shot, just to be safe, was in the back of the skull. We tag it, then sit down for a bit and make some coffee to process the events before we process the bear. But we have to take the skull and full hide for the COs to check over. But we don't eat bear due to the parasites. It's legal to leave the body, and we kind of have to, but it feels horrible, wasteful and dirty. Like we were still taking a trophy off this thing that should have never ended up like this. I can't remember if I had any tears over it that day, but I certainly feel like I could have, and probably did later on once the adrenaline wore off. The whole thing was just so sad and unavoidable. Dad and uncle and I talked about how it was all due to human activity in the first place, trying to reassure ourselves that we can't be held responsible for the action of others. We can only try and be as responsible for ourselves as we can. We ended up dragging the black bear a few hundred feet behind the shack. We won't be staying there for more than two days, and wolves are known to frequent that area, so we felt comfortable that we'd be off everyone's menu until time to break camp. Wolves defending an easy meal means free security in the area, and as long as we don't bother each other, we're happy to keep a few hundred feet of trees between us. The rest of the trip goes fine. We get our moose, uneventful aside from that. A CO camping the boat launch comes to check our tags, so we tell him the whole story about the bear. Having a tag negates the need for that, but considering the circumstances and our own sense of shame in the involvement, we wanted to make sure we got everything into the open. They needed to track stuff like problem bears and human behavior that creates them, and test the skull for various diseases to ensure the behavior issue isn't due to something that might be affecting the population. They reassured us that we did the right thing, given the crappy circumstance we found ourselves in, let us know where to turn in the skull and hide, and even returned the hide to us later. We had it tanned. We weren't sure how else to treasure what was left of that bear, and we wanted to keep the memory of the risk, the danger, and the responsibilities we face when we're out there. But that behavior, total confidence around humans like that is so unnatural, it almost didn't feel like a real bear, but not in a, maybe it's rabid way, just a, it knows I can't do anything to it, kind of way. I live in South Central Pennsylvania, Appalachia. Deep, deep, deep in the sticks. I work night shift, so on my days off I tend to stay up at night. I was binging on Netflix and just relaxing at about 2 to 3 in the morning when I hear a knock on an exterior wall of my single wide trailer. About midway down the trailer, it's just one hard knock, more like a thump, and instantly the hair on my neck stood up. I paused my show and listened for a few minutes, but there was nothing, so I shrugged it off. Going back to watching my show and hearing another one on the other side of the trailer. This time I was a little concerned. I draw my handgun and go to the door. As I'm reaching for the handle, I get a solid urge to not open the door. So I don't. I sit down on the couch and listen. As I'm thoroughly bugged, but nothing else happens for the rest of the night. The next night the same thing. I was watching Netflix and I heard a shuffling in the yard, draw my Glock and step out onto the deck. 
I shined the pistol-mounted light off the deck. The house is surrounded by deer, which is not abnormal for where I am at all. All the deer start kind of bounding away except one. It's bigger. The proportions were off, it just was kind of outside of where my light reached. I had alarm bells going off on my head. I point my Glock at it and it just starts walking away at an angle, walking all jerky, not bounding. While it's walking, it's still staring at me with both eyes. Kind of a crazy angle to have its head turned considering the way it was walking, and I watch it walk into the woods and go back inside. The next night I'm at work and I come home and my girlfriend says, can you get a handgun out the safe and load it and put it in the bedroom closet? Sure, why? I ask. Apparently she was up breastfeeding our newborn and she said she heard one loud knock on the door and it gave her the creeps. Kid freaked out too. And they didn't sleep the rest of the night. I didn't tell her about the knocks that night I experienced. I'm pretty sure the deer thing was a not dear. I've seen them one night on a country road before, but this was years ago, around 11 at night, when I was driving and saw something at human height on the road, with photoluminescent eyes, look at me, and walk into the woods. It gave me the creeps. I'm more wondering about the knocking on my trailer walls. What am I dealing with? Any help would be appreciated. And, FYI, the clearing I'm in, The nearest tree is 60 kilometers away, so I know it's nothing like acorns hitting the side occasionally, but what do you guys think? I lived in a part of Texas with dense forest. My friend and I were in middle school and enjoyed exploring at night. We learnt that the drainage pipes on the side of the road was big enough for us to crouch through, so we hopped in and started walking leaving markers to guide our way back. After 30 minutes to an hour of walking, we popped out of a manhole that landed us deep within the middle of nowhere in the woods. We kept walking until we came to an abandoned two-story cabin. No road leading to it, no means of accessing the cabin by vehicle. What could be argued as the front lawn was littered with half-buried toys All of them looked old in design, plenty of porcelain dolls were buried in the yard. The windows were too dirty to see inside, so we broke a window with a rock to get in. What could have been furniture at one point in time had rotted away so that only the iron frames remained. The floor of the cabin was completely covered in old empty oil cans, the kind you see in 50s cartoons. We couldn't go upstairs because the staircase had collapsed from rot, so we left and started making our way back to the manhole that we had come from. As we were walking away, I took a look back at the cabin. In the window of the second story room, I swear to God, I saw a child of about eight to ten looking back at me. He had short, straight black hair, and I am convinced that that day, I saw a ghost. Me and my friend were looking for mushrooms when I was around 13. I found a trash bag that smelled really bad. Bear in mind, this was very deep into the woods, and sometimes it isn't uncommon for people to throw out animals that they have ended in this area because that's the culture, unfortunately. But people wouldn't go that deep into the woods for something like this. I reached down and felt it, and I swear I felt a human elbow. It was squishy and not hairy like an animal. My dad forced me to stop touching it and told me not to tell anyone. I still regret that and wish I remembered where it was so that I could go back to check. This one time I was exploring the woods with my first girlfriend, when at the bottom of a coulee we found what looked like a tea party. There was a small pink round table and the chairs were set up with teacups on little saucers. It was creepy as hell, but we thought it was cool. We looked around the area and on the ground beside the tea party setup 
was a stuffed animal, as well as a children's backpack of My Little Pony. We didn't look inside, as this was our, oh crap, this is creepy moment, and left it. I did pick up the backpack before, and noticed the initials CB written on them. That night, without my girlfriend, I got curious and did some research. It turns out there was a little girl that had gone missing with the initials CB a year prior. Her body had been found in another part of the province though, but I still to this day can't help but believe that we had found the site of something horrific. I don't remember if the person responsible was ever caught, but he must have, if I never reported it. I'm a local to the South Jersey area, pine barrens and all. I hunt and I fish on the regular, and my house is in the woods. I'm used to the sounds and things that regularly happen around New Jersey, and I've had two experiences that I could never grasp an explanation for that still gives me the chills. The first one, it was a cold six-day firearm season, and it was opening day. I set my stand up in a new spot a little bit further than my previous year. I'm following my bright eyes to get to my stand and it's pitch black and cold. I'm saying minus four with the wind, which is not common in New Jersey, so it's already eerie as I'm walking through the pines, and I get about 25 yards from my tree, and I stop to light a cigarette before I go up. But as I'm standing there a mile deep in the pine barrens alone in the dark, I hear a grunt. Not a deer grunt. I'm saying a full-blown snarl. It stops and goes on for a minute or two, and at this point my shotgun is stacked to the rim, and I'm looking towards the noise. It charges me and gets about ten yards, and I shoot once, hitting it to the left. This sent it off into the darkness. So I figured, get in your tree now, so I book it. I'd say I'm ten yards away from my tree and I get charged again this time from the back, thrusting me to the ground. I went face down in delusion. Whatever it was hit me and kept going. I stayed in my tree till 10am when it was bright out. My only description of what the thing could have been was a hog mixed with a goat. It was absolutely terrifying, and we don't have wild boars here. For my second story, I used to fish in the Great Egg Harbour River regularly. My kind of fishing happens to be in the fall when it's cold. I walk a trail that used to go up to an old ship builder manufacturer on the river. I fish the old structure, as bass love it, however, there is still a remaining building that's standing. Not bad until you go in. So one day me and a friend of mine are going to catch the outgoing tide. We load up the truck, drove to the trail and hiked it about a mile. We get down and set up. Nice nor'easter off the coast, so the conditions are perfect. However, about an hour into some good fishing, the rain came, and if you live in the northeast, you know a nor'easter. When it rains, it pours, so we packed our stuff and headed for the building. Once inside, we set down our stuff and figure, screw it, let's chill for a while and explore the rooms. Which was a bad idea, as it gets creepy with the wind. So we walk up to the second floor where there was a line of rooms on the right and a balcony on the left looking over the building. As we approached the first door, my friend felt weird, like he didn't want to go anymore and immediately turned around with a big nope. I like exploring, so I kept on. I checked the first room and there was nothing special. I kept walking, checking the rooms one by one, and I got to the second to last one and got this weird sensation in my body. Almost like I received the worst news in my life. I broke down. I literally started crying. And once I got myself back together, I boogied down the stairs where I left my friend, and we headed for the truck. I grabbed everything and ran out to run back and grab my rod holder that I was using as a bum defense. And I looked up to the second story window, and from there I saw a child standing at the window. It's the scariest thing I've ever seen and I'll never go fishing there again. I was solo camping at the Lake Dubonnet campsite west of the lake. In the morning I set off for a hike near Lost Lake. 
I realised after a short while, as I neared Lost Lake, that the forest was absolutely silent. No birds, no squirrels, no wind, nothing. I felt like I had entered some sort of dream state. Why was this forest silent, I thought. As I kept walking, I started to hear the sound of what I thought was a helicopter approaching. I was confused by that. But there is a Great Lake Maritime Academy in Traverse City, so I thought maybe a helicopter was flying back to town. By that time, I had previously lived in Interlochen for two years, and had never heard such a sound. But your mind tries to make sense of things. I kept walking, and the sound continued to come nearer, and then became deafening, as though it was a buzzing in my ears. At that same point, I felt as though I could see behind me, and that a bear was running up to charge from behind and tackle me. At this point, the helicopter noise was super loud and I panicked, whipped around, but nothing was there, and the noise stopped instantly, and I felt like I had just woken up. I shook my head confused, looked all around, but there was nothing in the sky, no plane or anything. I was beyond perplexed. Of course, I wanted to go back to my tent and car ASAP, but I did not want to turn around and walk back past Lost Lake any more than I had to. So I kept going on the trail, which thankfully was circular enough to get me back to the campsite. I never experienced that again. I guess I'll forever be puzzled. My ex and I booked this amazing homestead for vacation for two days and nights after reading a lot of positive reviews online. It was managed by a charming and very hospitable elderly couple. Now this homestead is smack dab in the middle of a huge sprawling estate surrounded by coffee plantations on three sides. It has its own private waterfall and behind this estate are very large hills most of which are owned by this couple. The accommodation provided to us was quaint, a little cottage nestled between the main homestead where the couple lived, and another larger cottage that was occupied by a couple of tourist families. The three buildings are surrounded by a very beautiful tended garden. A narrow path winds in front of the three buildings and heads towards the hills. Our first day was generally uneventful, as both of us were exhausted from the long drive from the city we lived in, and we were just soaking in the hospitality and the amazing views all around. The next day, we were given the option to head to the waterfall or hike up the hills, and my ex, after a lot of debate, chose the hills. So a little after 10am, we packed ourselves a nice little brunch and headed out towards the path that led to the hill. The weather was cool, and a light bit of rain had kicked up the smell of damp soil that was invigorating to the soul of city folk. As we reached the end of this winding path, we were faced with hiking up a pretty steep incline directly up the hill or walking towards a now unpaved path that skirted around the hill. Since the rain had left the soil around us pretty damp, and the grass wet and slippery, we figured we could find a more gradual climbing spot if we skirted around the hill. So off down the unpaved path we went, and about 10 minutes into the walk, the terrain changed dramatically. Instead of open land, we were now walking basically into a ravine, and the trees on both sides of the ravine were blotting out the sunlight to a great extent. It was as if we were in the middle of the jungle all of a sudden, but unfazed. We still trekked on hoping to find another way to climb the hill, which was not visible anymore due to the terrain. After about an hour's worth of navigating through the ravine, we found that the path veered off into even more dense jungle terrain on the left, and on the right was a dilapidated old wooden hut that seemed long vacated. So as we took a breather to try and figure out what to do next, we were met with the angry barking of what I assumed were not less than seven or eight dogs, and the sounds were only getting closer. So we beat a hasty retreat back from where we came from. Once the barking subsided, we regained our composure, only to find tons of leeches trying to get on us from the wet bushes and blades of grass. 
This freaked out the ex and I had to run through the boulder-filled ravine to basically catch up to her. We ended up back at the steep spot of the hill, and by this time I'd had enough, but had to give her persuasion and ended up climbing the steep part of the hill on all fours getting dirt and grass all over. To my relief, the steep bit gave way to what I can only describe as a meadow of lush green and grass bordered on the left by bushes with sweet-smelling wild flowers, and on the right, an unobstructed view of gentle rolling meadows that actually had cattle grazing, but I didn't find anyone herding them. So an hour and a half later of hiking through the meadow, we chanced upon a muddy path carved into the gentle sloping hill. Now this hill was huge, but the path made the climb much more forgiving. Upon cresting the hill, the other side of the crest is a sheer drop, but the view of the valleys below was nothing short of spellbinding. We rested and tucked into the food we had brought, all the while admiring the view, and it was past 2pm now. The crest of the hill was so high up, that every time a cloud passed through, we were absolutely drizzled on, and after a few minutes greeted by the sun. This was heaven to a couple of city slickers. By 5pm I was starting to get antsy to start to negotiate our way back down, as I didn't want to slip on the still wet grass, and sure as heck didn't want to try my luck with climbing down in the darkness. After about a half hour of begging and pleading with a reluctant ex, I finally managed to drag her off back to the crest and start our climb down. The first thing I noticed was the absolute silence. No birds chirping, not even insect sounds. We were losing light faster than we could climb down, and the silence was really getting to me. I looked around to see if the cattle were grazing, but no, everything was now deserted, and it was at this point that I felt like I was being watched from behind. The ex was behind me while we climbed down, so I asked her to go on ahead of me, and when I would be bringing up the rear. In my mind, I wanted to put myself between her and any person that would meet us from behind, but a few minutes later I get the same feeling of being watched, not only from behind, but all around us except the front. All the hair on my forearms were upright. I was hypervigilant, almost bordering on panic. The ex didn't feel anything, but was creeped out by my behaviour. Up to that moment I had been cheerful and joking away and muttering everything I could think of, but now I was unnaturally quiet as per her observations, and extremely focused on getting off the hill, and at the time, looking all around and searching for someone. Before the silence and the sense of being watched hit me, all my mind was preoccupied with was to not slip and look out for snakes. But now that was not a concern. I urged her down faster but didn't tell her anything so as not to panic her, and partly to not seem like a blithering idiot in my mind. I was ready to slip and slide down the hill if it meant a faster way down, but I didn't want to leave her behind. After about half an hour of this torment, a new feeling crept over me. I felt anger from whatever or whoever was watching us, like we were not meant to be there, like we were trespassing. It was the complete opposite of absolute bliss of climbing up the hill, and still no sound, not a damn cricket to be heard, no wind, not even a breeze. Then as if by some miracle a dog appeared behind me. Had not seen this fellow when we climbed up. He was a thin emaciated brown mongrel who had his tail tucked between his legs and looked at us warily, all the while following us at a distance. Although the sight of the dog put me a bit at ease, the feeling of being watched lingered on. Since I also didn't want to be bitten by the dog, I made the ex stop and give way to see if the dog would pass us, and he did. He crept closer to us and wagged his tail, while looking at both of us and passed us by, still a bit wary of us. And then the most curious thing happened. He would climb down a bit and wait until we reached him, and would repeat this over and over until we reached the bottom of the hill. It was like he was escorting us to safety. I felt a slight bit at ease at last, now focused on the dog and desperately trying to ignore the still lingering menacing feeling that was now behind me and I finally realised that we were climbing down in the dark. And by this time we managed to get back on the paved path, it was 8pm and pitch dark. 
We were walking behind the dog who was now wagging his tail away and walking closer to us, and much to my relief I could see lights in the distance. The dog escorted us all the way to our cottage, and while I was trying to find some food for him he vanished. Only when we got off the hill did that feeling of being watched deplete. It was as if someone flipped on a switch, and the sound of insects all instantly returned. I swore to myself that never again would I put myself in a situation if I could help it like that. When we met our hosts for dinner, they said they were actually worried as we were expected back by four and were trying to reach us on our phones which had no network coverage throughout this whole ordeal. I didn't want them to ask about this horrendous experience that I had, but I inquired about the brown dog and if he was theirs. They told me he was a stray and was known for escorting past visitors up to the cottage but then disappear. He was nothing short of a miracle, a divine presence who guided us back to safety.